stop. He, he wants me to stop moving. It seems kind of mean, but okay. Let's see here. I will uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And uh, I just pray that you'd help us to uh, glorify you what we do. And we pray that people would have uh, a good sense to vote for the right person today, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. All right. Or persons. Let's see here. No voting, no writing Batman in, you know. That's what I might do. You should always sign wedding registries, Batman. It's just fun. What's that? No, no, no. You, you just identify as Batman. That suffices. You can't judge me. <laughs> oh. No, no, it's not. This is not. This is not. This is just. This is just to annoy the bride because she's the one who actually cares about the registry being proper and you know with the right names and so forth and so on and serious. Nothing rains on her parade like Green Lantern right in the middle of a sea of names or something, you know? Ruined her big day, it's mean. It was mean for her to make me go to it. I didn't have to go. But you you get guilty didn't go and see, all right. Counter fine. I I'll I'll let it stand. I'm right, you're wrong. There we go. See here. And so I go to weddings. Let's see here. The gamma function. Um, oh, hey, this was yours. Um, <clears throat> interesting enough. So the gamma function is definition 7 on page 393 of your book. I sometimes forget to cover this, but I shouldn't because it's kind of an important thing. And here it is. Gamma of t is by definition the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u, um, u to the t minus 1 um, du. All right? And... Um, very, uh, very interesting integral. If you integrate by parts on this, we'll find something. Um, but it's, it's helpful if I look at gamma of t plus 1 and integrate by parts on that and said, what would gamma of t plus 1 equal? u to the what? u to the t, right? So we'll do integration by parts. Um, let's think of this as being the Oh yeah, <laughs> the uh, the dv, and um, let me put a bar. Uh, this is annoying, and this will be my my u bar because we use u and v for yeah. And um, anyway, so long story short, here integration by parts gives me um, minus e to the minus u um, u to the t evaluated from zero to infinity. Um, plus t times the integral of e to the minus u um, du. Oh, I'm sorry. What's wrong with me? Uh, just, just, um, let me stop with this and just think. Sorry. Ay, ay, ay. Not a good sign. Um, what's that? I tell you, I, I know what's wrong with me today, but I'm going to have to change this to X. It's sad, but true. If I do this, then I'll be able to do it. I don't, it's just something in my head is messed up. So this would be my, my dv, this would be my u, right? So what's, what's v? Um, yeah, 1 over, see that feels wrong. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, uh, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice. Um, so I'm going to make this and this my du, or rather my, my dv, and I'll make this the, the, the u. Okay. So sorry. 
if I had any good sense, I would have just quoted this identity, which has little to do with differential equations anyway. I don't know why I'm spending class time on this. Um, ah! That's all right. Let me, hopefully, after this, it will get better. So let's just, we'll hope for that. So minus x to the t, good grief. Yes, minus x to the t. <laughs> x to the t minus e to the minus x plus the integral of t, um, x to the t minus 1, right, e to the minus x dx, evaluated from 0 to infinity. <clears throat> there we go. And of course, this has to be evaluated from 0 to infinity. So all I'm doing is integration by parts, just doing it badly. This piece goes away be because of um, uh, L'Hopital's Okay, L'Hopital's rule. Um, I was exciting here. Um, so this, this piece goes to zero. And over here, if you pull the t out, you've got the integral from zero to infinity of uh, x to the t minus one. So if I had good, any good sense, I would have written the definition of the gamma function in terms of x to start with because I should have anticipated my brain not working here. Um, so this is x to the t minus one, e to the minus x, dx. But what is this? I mean, this is the same as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x, um, x to the t minus 1, dx. So this, this is what? This is gamma of t, right? So we have this identity that gamma of t plus 1 is equal to t times gamma of t. All right? And you can also calculate some things pretty easily. Like, what, is, what would the gamma of 1 be? This is the integral from 0 to infinity of um, e to the minus u du, if you like. That works out to 1. All right? So here we go. We got gamma of 1 is 1, right? What's gamma of 2? Right, gamma of 2 is gamma of 1 plus 1, which is 1 times gamma of 1, which is also equal to, what do you say? 1. All right, what's gamma of 3? Gamma of 2 plus 1. I think it's not, I think it's, uh, that's 2, right? Um, 2 times gamma of what? Gamma 2, yeah. Sorry, I can't read what's right in front of my face. <laughs> Duh. Which is 2. All right, so anyway, this should start to look familiar. What we have, what's 0 factorial is 1. 1 factorial, 1. 2 factorial, 2. 3 factorial, 3, right? So in other words, gamma, this is gamma of 1 is 0 factorial. Gamma of 2, 1 factorial. Oh, it's 6. Good grief. Yeah, it's not a good sign. Um, and of course, gamma of 1 is, is, is 2 factorial. So you, you see what the pattern is here. What, what's the connection between the gamma function and the factorial? Gamma of n is equal to what? What I do? Oh, three. Yeah, this is not not a good sign. All right. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is why I don't lecture gamma functions. Or it could just be today. We'll find out when I change topics if it's just the gamma function that I have a problem with or if it's today. But um, gamma of n would be what? N minus one. Right, n, n minus 1 factorial. So there you go. This is the um, continuous extension, um, continuous extension of the factorial in this sense. If you wanted to calculate like what's 1.5 factorial, you could calculate the gamma function of what? I mean, I'll put quotes around this. What would 3.5 factorial be? You could understand that to be what? Gamma of what? 4.5, yeah. 
In other words, you have to calcula calculate the integral from 0 to infinity of um, e to the minus x times x to the what? 3.5, is it? dx. Yeah. So there you go. If you ever want to calculate 3.5 factorial, there it is. Now, that's a, no, I mean, that's not standard terminology, obviously. So if you calculate the Laplace transform of t to the power r, all right, then that is equal to the integral, right, of zero, zero to infinity of e to the minus st, um, t to the r, right, dt. That's just the definition. And then he makes a sneaky substitution. He makes the sneaky substitution of u equals to st, all right? If we make a u equals st substitution, how can we rewrite the, um, this, 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 uh, this integral here? But yeah, that's, that's e to the minus u, right? Um, if s is positive, then u is still going from 0 to infinity, right? Um, so the bounds don't change. But how about the t? What's t? Right? u over s to the, to the r, right? And then dt, what's dt? See, this gives me that dt is du over, it, over, over, over s, right? So you look at that. You pull out 1 over s to the r plus 1, right? Because that's got no u dependence. Integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u times u, u to the r du. But what's that? It's not quite gamma of r. It is, in fact, gamma of what? Gamma of r plus 1. And so there you go. That's what we do if we're faced with something like the square root, Laplace transform of the square root. We have to know what the value of the gamma function is at uh, 1.5, gamma 1.5, right? Now, if, if r is in the natural numbers, then we get gamma of, you know, let's say r equals to n. We get gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n factorial, right? See, because if this is true, if we replace n with n plus 1, what do you get? Gamma of n plus 1 is what? It's n factorial. The other way to write that, right? And so that reproduces what we found previously for, for whole number of powers, right? By the differentiation theorem, we've, we've looked at this before, right? Any, any questions? Okay. All right, now that I got that out of my system, let us move along here and work an example. So let's solve um, y prime prime, uh, let's say plus, uh, I don't know, um, 6y prime plus 13y equals to u of t minus 1 um, plus u of t uh, minus pi. And um, I'll keep things relatively simple here. We'll assume that y of 0 is 0 and y prime of 0 is 0. That will simplify our lives a little bit. So we want to solve this initial value problem. Remember, those are the unit step functions, right? So we take the Laplace transform of both sides. And what does it give us? We get s squared, big Y, plus 6s times big Y 
plus 13 times big Y, right? Working off the Laplace transform of the second derivative and first derivative. Um, if those initial conditions were, were non-zero, we had added some terms here, right? Um, but I'm trying to keep this example from getting too unwieldy so I didn't make those non-zero. Now this Laplace transforms to e to the, the minus s, and this Laplace transforms to e to the minus pi s. I think I have written those by hand on your sheet. All right. Now we solve for y. So we get y uh, is equal to um, 1 over s squared plus 6s plus 13. All right, times e to the minus s plus e to the minus pi s. Yep. No? Okay. All right. Now I need to calculate the inverse Laplace transform, right? Now this, it's not immediately apparent what to do with this. So let's, let's call this thing g, g of s, right? Uh, g of s is equal to what? Well, it, it's, it's equal to 1 over s plus 3 quantity squared plus 4, right? So we could look at this. You've got to tilt your head and squint, but you can see it. It's there. There's a 2. See that 2? But that 2 came with a half, right? And the reason we would do that is because then we could see that this inverse Laplace transforms to g of t equal to 1 half e to the minus 3t. <laughs> ah, sine sine of 2t, like a so, yep. That's the Laplace transform of the unit step function. We derived it last time. Oh. So the Laplace transform of u to the t minus a of s is equal to, oh, and you're right, I might be wrong. Oh, I'm wrong. Thankfully, I'm wrong. Oh, 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 oh. Let me fix this. Let me fix this example. All right, because I'm this far into it, I need to fix it. Now the fix is going to be surprising. All right, because you're right. You're right. This is the consequence of me not bringing my sheet and and uh, you know pride go through for the fall. I guess this is one over s e to the minus a s. You're right. You got me. But let me fix it. The good news is there's another function which we use a delta delta of t minus a. And this thing actually does have that. This is a very, very non-traditional way to introduce the direct delta function. But here it is. With that, my work is correct. All right. Um, and so I can finish this example which would give me y equals to um, the inverse Laplace transform of g of s times e to the minus s plus g of s e to the minus pi s. So what I did, guys, is I multiplied the g of s. I have to treat each one of those exponentials separately. All right? And I have to use the theorem. The theorem says that this is going to be equal to g of t minus 1, u of t minus 1, plus little g of t minus pi, u of t minus pi. All right. Now, in the little g is right there. So I actually have to work, put that in the practice here. This is 1 half e to the minus 3 times parentheses t minus 1 u of t minus 1, and then um, plus 1 half, oh, I've dropped my sign, not a, not a good sign. Let's see here, um, sine of 
Maybe I shouldn't vote today. Let's see here. Two times T minus one. I'm not sure I, I'm sure I trust myself here. Let's see here. T minus one, T minus one. And then, of course, I got my unit step function. And then plus one half e to the minus three times T minus pi sine of twice t minus pi. Of course, that could be simplified because we know that sine has a 2 pi periodicity. So like I, I can rewrite that as sine of 2t if I wanted to, but I'll leave it like that to emphasize the formula here. And then, of course, I've got u of t minus pi. All right. I will motivate this mysterious delta here before too long. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> now that would be the answer right there. All right, let me face the music and look at this example as I actually wrote it, um, because it is important for us to go through how to do that one. And maybe it'll be helpful to have these two both up here to contrast. Maybe. Now, before I get into it, any questions about this? Of course, ignoring the large question of what on earth are you talking about? What is this delta? <laughs> right? So if you can indulge me and set aside that question momentarily, I will explain what that is. It's called the direct delta function. Kind of a bad um, label for it, given that it's actually not a function. But there you go. All right. <clears throat> it is nevertheless a physically interesting thing. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, let's do this one. Again, we'll keep it relatively benign. We'll assume y of 0 is 0. We'll assume y prime of 0 is 0 for the purposes of this example. Take the Laplace transform. We did that already s squared big Y plus 6x, 6s big Y plus 13 big Y. Now, as I was uh, warned, I think, 1 over s e to the minus s. Thank you. And that's really annoying, 1 over s e to the minus pi s, you see? Because now when I solve for big Y, I have something that's not quite as pleasant. Um, so factor out the big Y and divide by its coefficient, you get Y is equal to 1 over s times s squared plus 6s plus, plus 13 times e to the minus s plus e to the minus pi s. If you don't see that in one step, you just need to work out the algebra, all right? It's just algebra. But for most of you, that's maybe a couple steps, and that's fine. You don't have to do it like I do it. Um, so now, the thing that was g, this thing, we could call this g again, right? g of s, that's not nice as it was in the last example, right? I can't just complete the square, tilt my head, and go, ah, that's the sine times an exponential. It's not that, right? This requires partial fractions. So we're going to have to say, well, g of s, sure, it's 1 over s times s plus 3 squared plus, um, plus 4. I mean, it's that. That's true. But that can be ripped apart using partial fractions into what? a over s plus b times s plus 3 plus c over s plus 3 squared plus 4. Now, some of you have been taught to do partial fractions without putting the s plus 3 upstairs there, right? Why do I put s plus 3 in the partial fractions decomposition here? Why? From a math perspective, it's possible. It's reasonable. It allows for the possibilities. It, it allows for the contingencies here. But from a more pragmatic perspective, 
that s plus 3 is there so that I can read the table backwards. With that s plus 3 there, I can clearly identify the term that is attached with b as being something that inverse transforms to a cosine times e to the minus 3t, right? If I didn't put the s plus 3 there, then I'd have to go through the trouble of taking the quadratic and reformulating it so I could clearly see what's my sine and what's my cosine when I take the inverse transform. So I'm just looking ahead by writing this, okay? Uh, you can agree or disagree, but anyway, we should all agree on the algebra at the end of it. 1 is a times, well, s plus 3 squared plus 4 um, plus b times s plus 3 plus c times s, right? So multiply by the denom denominator. We're trying to find a, b, and c, so what should we do? How about if we put s equals, s equals to zero is really nice because it kills b and c off, right? And it just leaves me the a term. What, what happens when I plug in s equals to zero? What do I get? It's easier to see before I completed the square, right? If you go back to this one, you can see immediately what happens when we put s equal to zero into that fact, that quadratic. We get 13, which of course is also 9 plus 4, but anyway, 13. So we get 13, 1 is equal to a times 13. So therefore, a is 1 13th. All right, well, there's one down, two to go. So the question is, what should you do with the other term? Do what? Put minus 3? You could do that. But um, I'm, liking, I'm liking s equals to minus 3 plus 2i. Because if I do that, that's a complex 0, right? That kills the quadratic piece. And it just leaves me with 1 is equal to what's... What's s plus 3 then here? It's 2i, right? So this gives me 2ib plus c times s. s was minus 3 plus 2i. And then multiply it out. This is 1 is equal to minus 6ib. Um, minus 3c, minus 4b, um, plus 2ic. And let's group stuff here. That gives us 1 is equal to uh, minus 3c, minus 4b, plus i times what? Minus 6b, plus 2c. And from that, you can see the real equation and the imaginary equation. The real equation this time is what? 1 is equal to minus 3c plus, or minus 3c minus 4b. Not especially exciting. The imaginary gives me 0 is equal to minus 6b plus 2c. Well, that's nice because that tells me that I can write, rewrite c as equal to what? c is equal to? 3b, right? And then you can take that and plug it into the other equation and get what you get. So that gives me 1 is equal to minus 3 times 3b minus 4b, which looks like, ah, what do you know, minus 13b, huh? So therefore, b is minus 1 13th. And what's c? Minus 3 thirteenths, right? Now, is this the best way to do the algebra? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, on, you wanted to plug in s equal to 0, right? You want s equal to minus 3 is what you want to do? Yeah. That's also a good path. s equal to minus 3 would have given us what? It would have given us 1 is equal to, well, 1 thirteenth. a is 1 thirteenth, right? Times 4. 
plus what? C, B times zero, right? C times, and that's what's minus three, right? So this gives us 13, one is 13 thirteenths, right? So this gives us nine thirteenths is equal to minus three C, therefore C is equal to um, minus three over 13, right? Which is what we got over there. Yeah. I think I like your solution better for this one. So I don't know. I mean, using the complex value, sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes it's like a distraction. You can do the algebra however you like, all right? This is partial fractions. It's the same essential algebra you faced in calculus two to integrate rational functions. But you have to learn how to do the algebra one way or the other, all right? OK. Let me stop talking about the algebra here. What did we find? Let's summarize. Collect our thoughts here. What do we get? We have worked out that g of s is 1 over 13 s, right? Plus, then the b was what? What was b? b was, uh, ba -da -ba -da. thank you, minus 1 thirteenth times s plus 3, and then minus 3 over 13 all divided by s plus 3 quantity squared plus 4. There you go. Any questions about the partial fractions before I erase? Of course, the other way you could have done the partial fractions is just to multiply out and collect you know, equate coefficients from the, the constant term, the s term, the s squared term. That would also have been an equally decent way to do the algebra. Um, I don't think it really makes much difference what you do as long as you have a clear idea about what you're planning to do. So you pick a path and go down it. Now, now that I have this, I can tell you what this inverse Laplace transforms to, right? What's the inverse Laplace transform? My little g of t is what? So 1 over 13 transforms to, inverse transforms to 1 13th, right? In other words, the Laplace transform of 1 13th is 1 over 13s, right? Um, this guy, then I get minus 1 13th e to the minus 3t cosine 2t. And then the 3 I need to look at as, this I should think of instead of as uh, 2 over 2, right? And we'll keep, we'll keep the 2 with all this to get myself the sign. But the rest goes into the multiplier, which is going to give me minus 3 26 e to the minus 3t sine 2t. All right. Okay, so what do we got? We've got y, right, um, is equal to, well, it's equal to g of s times e to the minus s plus g of s times e to the minus pi s, right? But we already know what the inverse transform of g is, because we did the partial fractions, right? So we can take the inverse transform of this, use the theorem, and the theorem tells us that y is equal to what? y is equal to g of t minus 1, u of t minus 1, plus g of t minus pi, u of t minus pi. So the big, big idea of example two is the same as example one, right? We take the Laplace transform, we solve for big Y, we do some kind of algebra to make it so that we can take the inverse transform, right? Then we actually take the inverse transform and that's the answer. So the, the, the overall logic is the same, it's just the process of finding a nice formula for little g of t was a little bit more involved here. Um, anyway, so that is um, 1 13th 
minus 1 thirteenth e to the minus 3 times t minus 1 cosine of 2 times t minus 1 big uh, big parentheses uh, minus 3 26 e to the minus 3 times t minus 1 sine of twice times t minus 1 all right let me make that big parentheses square so you can see it better this is all g of t minus 1 times u of t minus 1 and then plus big parentheses 1 13th minus 1 13th e to the minus 3 times t minus pi the cosine of twice t minus pi minus 3 26 e to the minus 3 times t minus pi times the sine of 2 times t minus pi close big parentheses u of t minus pi there it is so this is why partial fractions matters right in order to actually take the inverse transform we usually end up with needing to do partial fractions on something now yeah. questions I should have left that. <laughs> oh well. The direct delta function. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about that. All right. So what is the direct delta function? So first I would ask you the question, if we look at the unit step function, right? If we look at the unit step function, at um, say t minus a. What's the graph of the unit step function look like? It's like zero, right? You get to a, right? And then what happens? Jumps, yeah. Like that, right? So that's the graph of the unit step function. What's the derivative of the unit step function? Right, it's, it's zero. And then here, it, over a very short interval of time, it goes from here to here. What's that? That's, that's a spike. That's what that is. And then it's constant again. So that, that's exactly the, the delta function. You could think of that as being the derivative of the unit step function. I should be putting air quotes all over what I'm saying because, of course, you cannot differentiate a discontinuous function, right? Differentiability implies continuity, this we try to teach you in Calculus 1. And um, that is definitely discontinuous, right? The unit step function's got a discontinuity, so what? <laughs> so this direct delta function is not actually a function. It's more properly a distribution. Distributions are generalizations of functions um, which obey related but not quite the same rules. So the definition essentially of the direct delta function is this. If we integrate from say um, minus infinity to infinity, well I guess for us I should just integrate from zero to infinity. Zero to infinity of um, you know f of t times delta of say t minus a dt well, by definition, essentially, this gives us f of a. So the delta function, what it does is it turns integration into evaluation. Um, this is very nice, right? Because if I want to integrate the delta function against some other function, all I have to do is look, okay, if the function, if the delta function is, is one, is, is, if its argument is zero in the domain of integration, then we get something, otherwise it's just identically zero. 
Um, so what, what this is saying, so in the special case that f of t is 1, what do we get? And you know what, Let, I'm, I'm just, minus infinity is fine, minus infinity. So the, the key point is that the, um, the domain of integration um, is at least pass, it has to be, there has to be some neighborhood around where the delta is zero to make sense of this. But this, what would that be then? Here, the function is just the, the identity function, so what's that? That's just, it's just one, right. So what is that, what is that saying? I mean, what can we say? It's saying that if you look at the graph, right, I mean, this is not really the delta function, is it? Because the delta function is more properly like a line <laughs> at A, right? <laughs> this is saying that there is a unit of area under this infinite vertical line. This vertical line test segment has one unit of area. That's what that's saying. That'll kind of blow your mind a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. But this is well-developed mathematics. I mean, like, there's careful, rigorous mathematics that no reasonable professor should, should, should subject undergraduates to. Um, but it's done by some fellow named Schwartz back in, like, the 30s or something. And, um, of course, this Dirac is the Dirac who was the founder of quantum mechanics, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And if you take a junior-level course in electricity and magnetism, we use these delta functions all over the place to express uh, uh, a local distribution of charge. In other words, when, when charge is localized, all right, so like a point charge, um, we can use a direct delta function to express that uh, here. So charge density, in physics, we usually use rho, right? Charge density, dq dv, charge per unit volume. So what, what would the formula for this be? If you've got a point charge, a charge q, right? And it's, it's out here at some point, say R naught in space. What's the charge density for that? The charge density is zero if you're any point except what? Except the point R naught, except where the charge is, right? So if you integrate in three dimensions the charge density, it should be zero unless you contain that point, in which case the charge contained should be Q. That's what it means to have a point charge. What's the mathematics of that? It's this. When you integrate this thing in three dimensions, the only way that that's non-zero is if the point x naught comma y naught comma z naught is in your, your volume of integration. So that's what these direct delta functions are used for in electricity and magnetism is to express point charges, the density, the charge density for point charges. They're important there. But there's something else here. There's like a more uh, physics 231 interpretation of them which has to do with momentum. What if we interpret <clears throat> the Dirac delta function as a force? Would it, what can we say about that force? You know, what if we look at this as time, right? And we look at this as the force at time t being delta of, of you know, t minus, uh, t minus t naught. What can you say about the integral of f of t dt, if it is, you know, assuming that it um, is over some, if, if, if it's over some integration region, I don't know, what do you want here, t naught, t naught minus uh, delta, t naught plus delta, it doesn't really matter. As long as the uh, domain of integration, uh, let me just be lazy, minus infinity to infinity. There we go. Um, I don't want to think about it. The point is that the, the domain of integration has to include T naught for me to say what I'm about to say. What would that be equal to? Suppose this is the net force. What is that? That's also equal to dP dt, right? We learned that force is, yeah, it's mass times acceleration, but it's also the time rate change of the momentum, right? Assuming the mass is constant, we can move the m inside m dV dt. Do we get dDt of mv? mv is p. So 
Newton's second law can also be written that the net force is the time rate change in momentum, dp dt. And so to integrate the force is to integrate, <coughs> of course, this by definition of the direct delta function is one, right? But on the other hand, it's also the integral. And now I feel bad about the minus infinity to infinity. So uh, you guys give me time. How about time one and time two? And those should be what? Like just before and after time naught. There we go. I feel better now. Sorry, I, I have trouble making up my mind. You know this by now. T1 to T2, dp dt. So what, what happens when you integrate dp dt dt? dp 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 dt dt. What is that? Calculus one, right? This, this is P of T2, right? Minus P of T1. In other words, it's the change in momentum, which we call what? It's the impulse. The change in momentum over some finite duration of time is the impulse. And so that's why we often call the direct delta function in such this, in, in this context, it's often called the unit impulse. Delta of t minus t naught, unit impulse function. All right. Now, this might seem like a lot of hocus pocus mathematics. You know, the idea of a point charge is. Is that an actual reality or is that a mathematical idealization, right? So let me bring this back down to earth a little bit. Think about, you know, say taking something like this and, you know, hitting the, whoop, like that. It's not a great, not the best hammer, but you can imagine if you hit something, oh man, I need to bring a hammer. Oh well, it's too late. Anybody got a hammer? Could happen. Could happen. You're engineers. You're making stuff. I mean, who knows? Could happen. But um, if you think about a hammer hitting a surface, right? Think about a hammer hitting a nail. How do you describe that force? What is it? It's this sudden force, right, over a very short period of time. And if you wanted to model it, what really matters is the momentum that it gives to whatever it hits, right? You don't really care exactly how the hammer interacts with the nail. What you're really interested in is the net impulse delivered to the nail. Or let's think about a baseball bat hitting a ball. Right? It's another good example. Maybe better. It, you don't really so much care the minutia of how the baseball deforms and the elastic you know, interaction between the bat and the ball, the deformation, all that, and how the ball springs back off the bat and goes off. All you really know is that over some very short instant of time, this ball uh, it contacts the bat and goes the other way, right? So the bat gives the ball an impulse. That's this kind of thing. It's this spike of force that gives some impulse. We, we can judge the impulse from kinematics before and after, even if we don't know the specific details of how that force is occurring over the time period. So like roughly speaking, the actual things that the direct delta function um, models are probably more like this, right? This is maybe physically the force that looks like this, you know? This is maybe the, the actual, actual, actual force. But suppose you don't know about the actual shape. I mean, maybe it's got, maybe it's got some, some funky stuff. I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's all yucky and whatever. But what you can do is you can calculate the area under this force time graph, you know? You can calculate the area the integral, say from t1 to t2, right? If the integral from t1 to t2 of f of t dt, right, is equal to 7, fine dimensional j naught. There you go. Now I gave it, that's for units, right? It should be, what is it, kilograms meter per second? I don't know. I'm, it's been, I'm a little rusty. Then, you know, a good model that neglects all of this funky stuff like the details of that short spike of force would just be this. F approximate is equal to, well, it's equal to 7 J naught delta of whatever 
time is kind of the average here, let's say t naught, t minus t naught. See, and so what this, this, this force basically says, I know what the momentum is delivered from the model. I don't actually care about the details of how the force is delivered over that short duration of time. And that captures the essential features of the interaction of the spike of force. On the same token, you know, we talk about unit step functions being unit, like they're just steps, right? Like this. But, you know, this is u of t minus a. What, what's the actual, what's the actual, you know, if you're actually looking at an actual physical switch, what, what, is, what does it look like? It doesn't look like that, right? There actually is some finite duration of time in which the switching is happening. So, the honest thing is something more like this, right? And who knows? I mean, if it's actual mechanical switch, they're hard to find. Oh, there's one. Um, but with pre preferably with like an incandescent bulb where you don't have the ballast smoothing things out, there's actually, you know, you're putting a metal into a knife and there's actual kind of like bounce, the, the, the blade can bounce. There's actual, there, there's all kinds of junk in here in the process of going from times, you know, from zero to one. And if you replace that complicated physical switching problem with a unit step function, what you're saying is, I don't care about the details of this transition. All I know is that before it's zero and after it's one, and at time A is when it happened. So these are mathematical idealizations, right? But they're useful ones. All right, physical spiel over. Um, let me <laughs> get back to, back to math here. So the, the next topic um, that's important to us is the convolution theorem, all right? And um, I have some, so I, you've already seen my example one today, that if you're given a choice, right, if the test has two problems on it, right, and one is to work the Dirac delta function as a given force, right, the other one's to work a unit step function as a given force, which one do you choose? You choose the delta function, right, because when you take the Laplace transform, and I think I've neglected to do that, Kind of an important point. Watch, this is going to take us all of like 30 seconds. Laplace transform of delta function, how does it work? By definition, integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st, right? Delta t minus a ds. By definition of direct delta function, this is equal to e to the minus sa. There it is. So yes, I mean, that's much preferred to, I mean, if I have a choice to work that with this or work with that, I mean, I will definitely choose the direct delta function because this has this pesky 1 over s thing, right? And that 1 over s led us to much suffering in example two, right? Suffering we can't avoid, but suffering nonetheless. Yeah. All right. So I have some, um, some notes I'd like to share with you, and these notes will introduce you to the, the convolution theorem. And um, so the, the careful proof of the convolution theorem is found on page 400 of your text. I have a kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, hand wavy argument here to derive it. And it also fits into part of a larger story, all right, which I'd like to share with you now. So this is posted on the web page. It's um, towards the top of the, I'm find my adapter, towards the top of the, uh, the differential equations page. I think it's, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's right at the top of the course page, I can tell you that. It's like a little uh, maybe 10-page PDF that I have collecting these thoughts. I, these, these are in your book, um, par parts of it, but the story I tell in this PDF is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit bigger idea than what's in the book. And the, the book is not bad. The book explains what's called the transfer function, um, which, is, which is a beautiful idea. Um, come on.
All right, there we go. So if I can. There we go. Yeah, you hit it if you don't mind. Thanks. Got to get my laser. Um, so here, I want to discuss with you guys kind of a bigger idea um, that puts together some of the calculations we'll be doing into a larger goal, all right? And it's partly a mathematical goal, but it actually has lots of applications um, to engineering and, and, and other things. So the basic idea is this. We're, we're, we've been looking at how to solve L of Y equals to F, where L is what? Like a constant coefficient differential operator, right? It's, it's a n, you know, constants times derivatives to various powers, right? And um, we used the, we had different methods to solve this earlier, right? But now, um, you know, we're basically still involved in this project. How do you solve for Y? So if you just take a step back, if you've got like sine of theta equal to a half, how do you solve for theta? Inverse sine, right? So how about this? Is there something like inverse L? Can we find some inverse to the differential operator? Right? Now sine has a trouble. If you just try to take, you know, inverse sine of a half, well, yeah, we'll get pi over six, right? But then you know that that's just one of a whole infinity of solutions, right? We have the same trouble with L of Y, the solution here, right? Because there's not just one solution to this. There's a whole family of them, right? If it's an nth order problem, we know that we have n arbitrary coefficients in the solution. So how do you hope to, I mean, if you're going to take an inverse, then you'd have to give not one thing, but n things. Well, that's not a function. So to fix that, if we focus our attention on the solution which has all of the initial data being zero, then there's hope that we can find an L inverse. We'll, we're gonna, we're gonna find the L inverse which gives me back Y which has all of the initial conditions being zero. That's the idea. Okay, so let me just walk you back down memory lane here. We've already done this for the first order case. First order case. If we have a linear differential equation, which is what I'm considering here, then the L was DDT plus P. This was the, remember that, for uh, when we do integrating factor technique, right? Here's the general solution. And we actually solve, this is the general solution that has, this will have Y of zero is zero, right? Because integral from zero to zero is zero. And so there it is, Y of T is equal to the integral um, from zero to T of this Q times K of UT, where K of UT is actually the exponential of this, this integral. Now you say, well, what is K? I'm making up K. I'm pointing out that the structure of the general solution is that it's some integral of the forcing term here, which is Q, across some function, K of UT. This, this function, which appears in the integral, is called Green's function. It's called the Green's function for the problem. So the idea is basically that you can build L inverse from integrating over the appropriate Green's function. The second order case. To solve that in general, we did variation of parameters, right? So variation of parameters, we had y is equal to y1 times that plus y2 times that. If you put this all together into one grand glorious formula, you get this thing times f of u to u. Well, this thing is the Green's function. Again, there's something we can integrate times the forcing function to get the general solution to the problem. So in, in some sense, this, this, this integral is the, the inverse operator to L. <clears throat> so there it is specifically, L inverse of F of T is, I integrate over this K times F of U to U. This builds the particular solution which solves for that given force, all right? Again, there's this Green's function that we can calculate, this time by variation of parameters. And once you find that for a, a fixed system, it doesn't matter what force you put on it, if you feed that force to the inverse operator, it spits out the solution which has initial condition zero. 
So obviously we'd like to have a method to find the Green's function, right? Because to find